Let's get ready for our next session coming up here. Let me bring up, uh, we're going to be bringing in Alex to talk about, once again, accessibility with technology. Let me add Alex in here. Hey, there, hey, Alex. hey, hey how's it going? Going well. Um, accessibility with .NET and AI. Now, we, we had Rachel on just a little bit ago talking about how we can use the tools to help, uh, help detect accessibility issues in .NET MAUI applications, mm -hmm. but it sounds like you got something a little bit more interesting to help with accessibility here. Oh yeah, I mean, we're, we're gonna make accessibility a little bit more fun here. We're gonna talk about playing games and, and automating and using AI and the latest in .NET and the Onyx runtime. So mm -hmm. I hope you all caught the announcement talking about the new uh, version two of the Onyx runtime. We're gonna talk a little bit about that and all sorts of fun ways to apply AI towards accessibility and, and usability for people with disabilities. Oh, that's awesome. Let me add in your slides here and I will hand over the conference to you. Thank you so much, Alex. Awesome. Thanks. So we, we got a lot to go over. Please, please, please raise your questions in chat. I will be hanging out after I'll be able to answer them in chat as well. Uh, but we're going to be talking about making games and apps and really technology in general, even I've got my friend here, the the Canova Jocko robotic arm that I might bring out at some point. We're going to talk about making them all more accessible to people of all abilities uh, using the latest in .NET, AI, and Azure. Uh, real quick, I'm Alex Dunn, but you'll find me mostly on the internet uh, as Suave Pirate because Alex Dunn is an extraordinarily ordinary name. Uh, and so it's a little bit hard to find me given that there are actually two Alex Dunn developers at Microsoft. So even if you're like the Alex Dunn who does Microsoft tech stuff, there, I'm still, you know, fighting an uphill battle here. So find me a Swab Pirate. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I have been for uh, going on seven years uh, and, and really share a lot about basically applying AI for accessibility, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, I want to sort of start with, with framing the why uh, in, in why we talk about accessibility, why we talk about it in games, why we talk about it in uh, general application development. And really, it comes down to a, a core issue that we've created. We introduce technology at younger and younger ages, as old as three and four years old in the US, Canada, and, and Europe for the most part, and even in other parts of the world as well. Uh, we bring this technology into classrooms as early as preschool. And with that, we can do amazing things. We teach kids how to build and create uh, this, for example, from First Robotics. Uh, if you've ever done a FIRST Robotics contest, either as a mentor or uh, as a contestant yourself growing up, it's an amazing thing to watch kids create, uh, build, and solve problems with technology. They also use it in their social lives. We use it uh, as part of gaming and creating social environments. Social media is a core part of how kids are raised nowadays, as well as how they access media. Um, but what if they can't participate in any or all of those things? Uh, and, and this question is something that I've wondered about for a while, and I've, I've now worked with thousands of, of kids and thousands of adults, too, uh, trying to sort of figure out this, this question. Uh, and really, the, the issue that we sort of created as a society, we kind of slipped and fell into a systemic problem by introducing technology in more ways and creating more dependencies on it. We can accelerate things a lot faster, but when we do that and leave people behind, they're basically falling behind at that same accelerated rate. And so, you know, the, I sort of look at this and try to figure out what the root of the problem is. You know, we talk about accessibility, we talk about usability, we talk about being inclusive in our application development quite a lot, which is great. Uh, but trying to get to the root of the problem, is this something that we're responsible for as developers? My answer to that? Uh, is no, it's this guy's fault. This is Christopher Latham Scholes, uh, and he is the single one to blame because he made the QWERTY keyboard layout that has driven so much of how we've designed technology, even as we've introduced things like touch screens and new sensors and even the mouse back in the day. Everything has been rooted in this concept of the keyboard going back to how we uh, did it with typewriters and printing presses as well. But as developers, we can solve Mr. Christopher's problem uh, that he's created for all of us. And we do that with video game violence. Uh, so fair warning, there is a little bit of video game violence ahead. I try to minimize it, mostly in the fantasy side, a little bit of first person shooters. Uh, but we're going to we're going to dive a little bit into to how we we create solutions uh, using this type of technology. Uh, so this is a screen that that I've seen quite a lot in my life. Um, maybe some of you have played games before have as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with this screen, this is probably the most common screen that everyone has seen in this game called Dark Souls. Uh, now, Dark Souls is historically one of the most challenging games. It's sort of touted as that. 
uh, in the the sort of gaming world, uh, not just the single game, but as a series of games that come out, and even the latest installment of Elden Ring from the same developers at From Software. And so when looking at this problem of what happens when we you know, leave people behind in their access to technology and, and how we solve it. I wanted to solve it at the, the most challenging level, the most challenging game in one of the most challenging forms of software and access, uh, which is gaming. So I started with this question of what if I made an AI that could help play Dark Souls for me? Now I'm pretty good at Dark Souls, but certainly not the best. And I figured if I could solve it for me and solve it for specific people that I'm working with that have disabilities that can't play Dark Souls at all, maybe we're onto something. So a couple rules, no hacks or mods. Uh, it has to kind of the concept has to be able to extend to other games. It has to be usable by not just me. That's kind of the whole point. Uh, and it has to actually work. It has to make the game uh, more accessible, more usable uh, for different people. And the first thing I started with is uh, doing image recognition and computer vision uh, to figure out when to dodge or attack. And essentially, it looked like this. Here, here's a, a screen from Dark Souls 3. This is one frame of the game. Uh, it's a, a sort of third-person fantasy game. And basically, the process looked like this. We go through and did multiple playthroughs. This is all on Twitch, and, and all the VODs are up, by the way. Uh, so if you ever care to watch us going and labeling all of Dark Souls, it basically looked like this. Big scary sword labeled, cool guy labeled. Detect when things are basically dangerous and try to augment our inputs by... Uh, rolling away or supplementing attacks and things like that. Uh, seemed like a great idea at first. You know, we could do that. We could apply it to other games. We could uh, run it in the background. We didn't need to change the game itself. We just needed to supplement some inputs and, and read each frame. Uh, but we ran into some challenges with that. Namely, that you're kind of always in danger in Dark Souls. Um, and on top of that, uh, we cooked an entire graphics card. I mean, quite literally melted uh, while trying to play a high-intensity graphics game uh, and also run a computer vision model locally that was going to detect mushrooms that were trying to punch me. So that was off the table. I then wanted to look at other solutions in other games like Call of Duty. Latest Modern Warfare 2 just came out. Very fun. Warzone 2 is coming out in a couple of days. Can't wait for that. Uh, and in my experience playing uh, games like Call of Duty with my friends, I tend to yell at it because I'm not very good. And I yell at it in fun ways like saying, Serpentine! Serpentine! Whenever we're trying to essentially dodge things that are happening. And I thought, well, I can do this. I've done speech recognition. I've built tons and tons of apps in .NET. Uh, let's go tackle this problem. And essentially it looked like this. A user would speak to a device which would talk to some voice assistant service. Uh, we started by doing this with Alexa actually and, and using the .NET SDK from Tim uh, Hewer for that. Going to some API that was then going to communicate over a WebSocket connection with SignalR to a Windows client, which was then going to simulate input back into the game. And basically it looked like this. We had a single endpoint set up that would receive the post request uh, from the Amazon platform, from the Alexa skills kit. Uh, we would then say, okay, cool. We got, uh, for example, down here, the intent to uh, reload. And if we needed to reload, we would just pass that right back down uh, over SignalR uh, to all listening clients. As I was just the only one playing it, it was my Windows client, my Alexa skill, my locally running app, although I ended up putting it up in Azure. Uh, talking down to my Windows app. So basically blast it out, let it know that, hey, we need to reload. And then what we would do on the Windows side is connect to that SignalR hub, uh, which you could see at the time was Warzone Voice Controller, uh, .azurewebsites.net, just running as an Azure app service. And when we got that intent, we would use the input simulator uh, to simulate a key press, like pressing the zero key or the four key or simulating a mouse click or something like that. Uh, which was great. We got it all working. Um, we, we were able to see numbers being typed into a notepad and we brought it into a game. And we said in this very long and, and just super you know, useful phrase, Alexa, tell the Warzone controller to shoot, uh, at which point nothing happened. Uh, so what about other games, right? We went back to Dark Souls, same thing didn't work, back to Sekiro. I should have known this wasn't going to work because it's the same game engine. And then we went into the browser, this game called Krunker that someone in chat had recommended. Uh, and this actually worked pretty well because uh, we were just using it as browser input. And for whatever reason, that was working. Um, we also ran into an issue where I thought I was banned from uh, Call of Duty. A pro tip for all you .NET developers out there. If you're ever trying to simultaneously play a game built by Blizzard or running from Blizzard or Activision, do not run the Visual Studio debugger. You can run .NET apps. When you run the debugger, the game just crashes. I can't explain why. I talked to some of my friends on the Visual Studio team who had no idea why. I talked to some of my friends at Activision and Blizzard. 
No one has any idea why. If you ever run into this situation in your future, remember this conversation. That's the issue. They just don't play well together. Uh, some other things we tried along the way, we did WPF with send keys as well as win forms with send keys. We tried doing extended background tasks. We even tried doing USB over IP and nothing really worked. Uh, basically, in order to receive inputs natively to a game, it has to go over USB, which is why we introduced using the Arduino Leonardo, uh, which actually has this really cool uh, feature to it. So does the Arduino Micro, by the way, if you're into that sort of thing, um, where it does true USB, HID, the human interface device standard, uh, but can also do serial over the same port. There's basically this little chip here that can do the conversion back and forth, which is cool. Uh, and so that meant that we could communicate to it from our Windows app over serial and say, hey, please press the space bar, for example. And it could actually go hit the space bar back, just like is a, a real keyboard or mouse or gamepad would. Uh, plus, it's got a cool name, the Leonardo. Now we've got a great name for our project. So this is what the, the sort of system architecture looked like. Now we talked to a device, in that case, it was an Echo, uh, that would then send a request to our API to say, hey, they, they said shoot, uh, which would then send it over SignalR to the Windows client. The Windows client over serial would send it to the Arduino and the Arduino would say, please click the mouse or please press the space bar. Uh, now I wanna make sure I'm sharing uh, audio here. So let me uncheck that. And uh, hopefully you're able to hear this because this is the first version of it actually working. Oh, shoot. You are attacking. Kind of like predict where they're going to head into. Alexa, tell Warzone controller to shoot. You are attacking. Okay, Chad, we need you guys to get one headshot. That way we can at least get the highlight. So someone's got to start shooting. Take a shot. Take a shot. <laughs> there it is. Oh. All right. We're talking, and maybe there's something there. We're playing a video game with our voice and our hands. And I don't know if you caught that. Twitch chat was also playing, too. Uh, for those of you on the Live Coders team, hit me up about how to make that work, because that's a ton of fun. Uh, so we, we basically jump into the next phase, which is scaling the solution out uh, into supporting more things. And this project's on GitHub. If you want to follow along with the code there, uh, it's on uh, my GitHub at Swab Pirate, and it was called Swab Keys at the time. Uh, some of it's outdated. We've rewritten a lot of it, uh, but that's sort of the original prototypes that we're referencing here. Uh, so we need to scale this out, uh, which basically looks like taking every single one of these nodes and being able to support many different things, so different users, different types of devices, different voice inputs, different clients, and of course, more than just the Warzone controller. Uh, so let's talk about supporting more platforms. The first thing that I wanted to do is supporting more on the left side of supporting more voice assistance is what I do in my day-to-day -day as the head of product at Voiceify. So we introduced that ability to use all these different voice services across essentially anywhere we could get a microphone uh, to start sending commands. And on the right-hand side, we're using .NET MAUI. Uh, and now at .NET 7, .NET MAUI, GA today, uh, or at least this week, which is pretty great. So now we can write that single uh, code base in .NET for our API to handle multiple different voice assistant inputs. And we can handle uh, as many different platforms as we want, iOS, Android, Mac OS, Windows, and so on, uh, as receivers of those commands to do things. So in order to support more users on both sides of that, we need to authenticate and authorize our users. Uh, so basically, that means anything going from the left side to the right side needs to be authorized. So we need to authenticate the voice side of things, and we need to authenticate the uh, client side of things as well. So from the um, mobile and desktop app side, we were using uh, the, at this in this case, it was the uh, uh, Xamarin Essentials uh, Web Authenticator. Now this is baked in uh, to basically do OAuth. So we, we implemented OAuth 2 uh, with Pixie and the auth code grant flow into our API. Uh, and then we would basically sign into that account uh, or create accounts and then sign in from the desktop app or from any of the mobile apps. And then we were also able to do the far more complicated side of things, which was authorizing and authenticating voice assistance, which sounds really complicated because it's doing a whole lot of different steps. If you're looking at the UML chart we have up on screen, uh, but really it's not that complicated to set up. You basically just give it a different auth client ID and secret and you paste the URLs in and you send back a response that says, please tell the user to sign in. They link their account once and then they're off and running. Uh, but now we're able to handle that on our ASP.NET API uh, as well by adding uh, bearer token support. So our OAuth endpoints are going to be able to issue refresh tokens as well as access tokens. Those access tokens just get sent in the authorization header uh, with the type set to bearer. 
Uh, so we get that whole token and now we're able to know, hey, this person when they're signing into SignalR or when they're signing or sending authorized requests uh, against the HTTP endpoints like the voice assistants do, we know it's the same person, uh, which means that we're able to make sure we're sending requests down to the right client uh, when the user speaks to the assistant instead of doing what we did before, which was that broadcast to everyone. And then on the client side, this is what it looks like using that web authenticator where we take our URL, we sign in and we provide a URI scheme uh, that we're going to be using uh, to register our app to say we can handle this URI scheme. In this case, it's suave keys, uh, get the code back, then go get an access token and then keep that in, in memory so we can send it with each subsequent request. We also needed to be able to customize it so that we could handle more games. And we did that by creating what we call keyboard profiles. You could select a specific key, then basically say what voice commands you want to use for it. So jump can be space, forward can be W, switch can be one and two, uh, up, down, left, right can be the arrow keys and so on. We can also create macros by being able to chain these different outputs together and then even queue those things up. So for example, in this double jump, if I say double jump, it'll hit the space bar twice, but I could also say jump, jump, jump and queue up three space bars to execute. Uh, and then essentially what that looks like for that round trip, talking over uh, serial down to the Arduino, basically we take this event, right? So the SignalR hub on the client side in the Windows client says, hey, I got a request to send this command. We match it against the profile. The person said jump, so we know we need to hit the space key. Um, let's go send this string of press space for 500 milliseconds over the serial port down to the Arduino. And then on the Arduino side, we handle those serial commands by prefacing which command goes to which function. So because we say press space 500, whenever we get the press command, we fire into that press command function. In that press command function, we're getting the rest of the arguments. So what was the word that the person said? In this case, it's space and how long should we hold it for? Uh, and so we then send back the keyboard event of the actual space. So now we need to prove that it really worked, right? So we've got all this customization stuff which is really fun. We have a whole Windows app, mobile app. Uh, we're using Google and, and Alexa and, and even talking over the app itself, but we wanted to make it even more usable and compete with it. Uh, so one of the things that I love to do when streaming on Twitch is compete in hackathons. Uh, so we submitted this along with a couple enhancements to this little platform uh, to two different Azure hackathons. So the Azure US Hack for Accessibility, uh, as well as to the Azure AI hackathon. And basically the updates looked like this. Uh, the mobile apps and desktop apps for voice would also send information over to, at the time, Lewis, now all baked into COG services. Uh, and we would also take your um, camera stream and use Azure's cognitive services to detect smiling uh, and use that as another input. So now you have hands-on keyboard plus face plus smiling in order to send inputs. Um, now it's a little bit slow, but in the end, it actually ended up working and here's a quick example of that going back to Sekiro, just because it's my favorite game of us doing it. And you'll see that really long delay there, too. All right, hopefully it continues on the one we just did and not our new game plus four. Attack. Oh, boy, that's there slow. We go. Oof. We also did this, what I think is probably the hackiest thing I've ever built in my life, um, where we turned Snapchat into a controller uh, and we won a bunch of, of stuff there, the innovation award and the pitch contest award. Now this essentially looked like this, we had a mobile app that opened the Snapchat app that had a custom lens and it would detect different face expressions and hand gestures. For each one of those, it would show a QR code. We then built another Windows app that you could plug your iOS or your Android phone into your computer, and then it would stream your phone screen. And then we use the zebra crossing library to detect those QR codes, and then it would send the commands up. So you could sign into the Snap Reader desktop app with your same uh, Suave Keys account, and it was able to send commands just as if it did if you were speaking to it. So here's a quick demo of that in Fall Guys, which is really fun. Uh, so the left side is Snapchat, the right side is my, my face, and the anime filter also from Snapchat. But you'll see the left side is going to flash a bunch of QR codes. And then in the center, you'll see the... <laughs> Every time I take a I'm going to have to like, keep my coffee down here so I don't have to use my hands. So I'll be like... All right, this is a good one. I guess, like, I'm going like, to do been, like punching my coffee. All right, we're playing one-handed. 
So I'm gonna keep my other hand here, so I can just be like, real quick. Just to see if it's working, I'm gonna use my eyebrows. A little jump, a little fist, a little jump. There's the jump dive. We also let uh, our, our Twitch chat control it as well. So I built another Windows app uh, where you would sign into the same account and then you would sign into your Twitch account and the Twitch bot that you were signed into would start listening to the chat that you specified for that channel. And whenever it got a message of press and some key value, uh, it would send that along. So here's back in, in the old war zone, uh, keep an eye on the right side of chat who's saying things like exclamation point, press jump and exclamation point, press shoot. Uh, and it's actually taking that action in the game. Someone give me a no scope. How's the delay on chat now? Now the. <laughs> Come on. Okay. See, I told you I minimized the video game violence. So all of this together really became something that we wanted to take to production, uh, and this is called enabled play. Uh, There's a couple other things we needed to sort out performance, privacy, price, and scale for the most part. Uh, you may remember back in that Sekiro video we went through and I said attack. Uh, it took over three seconds to do that. And the main reason was because of the way that we were using speech recognition uh, over the cloud to basically process that into a command. And essentially it looks like this, you detect audio start, you then listen and record the audio, you detect the end of speech, and then you process it. So no matter what, there's going to be about a second and a half delay. So what we switched to instead is this always on offline uh, speech recognition that is predicting what you're going to say before you even finish saying it. And it's doing that by using actual microphones on the hardware itself or using your existing microphones that you might have on your Windows machine, on your Xbox, on your phone. Uh, and so on using .NET MAUI. So now instead we're continuously processing that speech. And so what we got for, in terms of performance saying that jump, 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 the fastest we ever got the sort of standard cloud speech recognition was 1.5 seconds. Uh, and with the predictive speech recognition, we got it in under 30 milliseconds from start of speech. Literally jump, 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 done. We also don't have to stream that audio anywhere. It stays offline. Uh, we keep it on the device and it never leaves, which means you can also play offline games this way too, instead of having to stay online the whole time. Now we also uh, do the same thing for, oops, where'd we go here? Accidentally hit the back key. Uh, the same thing for face expression detection. We now are using the Onyx runtime locally within the app itself to record your video stream, detect discrete changes in your face, uh, and then use that to trigger events. So now it basically looks like this, where you have the physical device controlled over Bluetooth or over WebSockets from the mobile app, uh, which is then plugged into any device that can use USB. Uh, and again, even third-party apps and devices can talk to the API in the same way over SignalR uh, and right back down. So real quick, I want to give you a quick sort of show of how we use the Onyx runtime. Uh, to process face detection. And basically this is a, a really sh small uh, little .NET app that we have, a little console app, uh, where we are taking a list of, uh, of images, a collection of images, and we're running it through this face detector. Uh, and our goal is to extract landmarks or what are essentially specific points on your face, around your chin, on your nose, around your eyes, your pupils, your eyebrows, uh, the, the frame around your head. And what we can do when we detect those in real time offline on the edge is process changes in them in order to execute commands. So we initialize our, our model detection for both detecting faces as well as detecting the face landmarks. We then take every image in this folder. Uh, we create a bitmap of it. We then run it through the face detection. So we're just saying, hey, are there faces here? For each of the faces that we find, uh, we're then running it through the landmark detection, which is really cool. So now we we have the faces, we we basically reframe it, we crop it into the square of where that face is. We're no longer working with the full image. Uh, and then we just get the landmarks and we paint it back over. Uh, and then we just save an image to a new folder instead. So what we can do then, just pulling up a couple quick examples here. Here are some inputs uh, of my face, which I'm just pulling up from my other monitor here. Uh, for example, here was uh, one of my profile pictures, my super cool shirt that I wanted to wear today, but I can't wear high pattern shirts because they're not a lot. Uh, it's just loading off screen. Oh boy, it's tiny. We're going to zoom in. Zoom, enhance. It's even a pretty low res image. Okay, beautiful me. 
And then we run it through the model and we get our result, which looks like a clown version of me. So zoom this in a bit. And so you'll notice each of these landmarks that it's picking up, each of these points uh, where we're picking up the edge of my face, uh, the different eyebrow curves that I have, the, the sort of circle around my eyes, the bridge of my nose, uh, my inner and outer lips for both my bottom and top lips, which means as I'm speaking like I am right now into the camera, every single frame on a 30 frames per second, we're, we're basically pulling out that image from the video frame and sending it to this model, which is able to do this recognition in real time. We're even able to do this all the way back in UWP uh, by basically manipulating software bitmaps instead. And now with this, we can do things to detect like different face movements, left, right, up, down, use that as inputs, use voice as inputs, use custom hardware as inputs, and all these different third-party virtual buttons, Twitch chat, Snapchat, if you're still into using that instead of this offline uh, face expression detection um, and really anything in order to generate these different inputs. So uh, just to sort of show you what it actually looks like in the app, uh, again, a, a .NET MAUI app, you basically go in and you start sending commands. Uh, so you can tap it to start and stop listening. Uh, you can use tilt control. So using the sensors of your phone, left, right, up, down, or shaking it as an input, that little black dot crossing from the blue to red side. Uh, this is how we use the face expression. So it's not redrawing the image here, but you can see it detecting different movements of my head, uh, winking, eyebrow raising, smiling, head tilting and turning. We can create virtual buttons. Uh, we can even take what is a more accessible keyboard, the mobile keyboard with like swiping and tapping and use that to type uh, on our physical PCs uh, and, and basically take the physical con uh, keyboard and controller out of the picture or use it in tandem. And when we use all of these different inputs at the same time, and we can automate using them as well, not just by doing single inputs, but by automatically executing tasks, running macros, firing off third-party API calls. Every time we get an input command, we can really level the playing field for everyone, regardless of their uh, dexterity and ability uh, and cognitive load that they might have to have because they can communicate now to their technology in the way that works best for them. So I wanted to leave you with this uh, sort of statement and I hope this, this is what you basically got from this session, which is as developers, especially as .NET developers, uh, we have the tools to build things that can really change lives. Uh, and I hope that you'll join me in doing so uh, and building more accessible things, building more accessible technology and tools, uh, and having more fun doing it in a more private way, too. Oh, man. Uh, Alex, there's some really cool tech that you showed there. I loved seeing face detection and the oh, yeah. different ways that the AI was allowing you to integrate and play with these games. Uh, dear Lord, uh, Fall Guys, I'm I'm still terrible at Fall Guys, by the <laughs> way. Uh, I, I still haven't won a, a, a race. But uh, I love seeing the integration there. So cool. And, and knowing that we can take these steps as .NET developers is, is really neat stuff. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, thank you for having me. And again, um, I'll, be, I'll be in chat uh, if, if there are any more questions. I'll hang around for a little bit and answer some questions too. Very cool. All right. Well, I'm going to say goodbye to Alex here. Have a good one.